Welcome to the campaign strategy section of my Vampire Coast guide. In this section, I will go over the campaign gameplay of the Vampire Coast and explain the differences between each faction. I will also cover expansion options, unique gameplay features, and just about anything else I can think of. Disclaimer, this guide is based on my personal experience and opinions and is by no means the definitive way to play the game in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. Now that's out of the way, let's get into the video. The Vampire Coast campaign is unique with several features that stand out from almost any other faction in the game. They both occupy settlements and have horde-like building chains on certain lords so you can recruit on the go and use settlements for purely financial support. This allows you to have a great economy once they get set up, but at the beginning it was a little strained due to the low income without constant battle. Fortunately, once you do get into a flow of constant battle, they can make some serious cashola from sacking, and since they don't really have much use for high level settlements, I found myself taking this option nearly every time as the money was due to pass up. The constant battling while profitable can put you in the position of having too many wars going on at once, and if you expand in the wrong direction, these wars can surround you and really hinder your progress so it's best to consider before you declare war on everyone. Confederation doesn't really help this since most of the other factions won't even speak to you unless you declare war on all their enemies, meaning you need to be quite the aggressor to win them all over. The aggression also comes at the cost of the evil tax, which means that most non-evil factions will be unwilling to trade with you. This means that your income from trade will be minuscule compared to the good factions, and while it doesn't cripple you, it certainly doesn't help. The Vampire Coast also have access to treasure maps, which are small exploration-based side quests, which allow you to collect a bunch of items and gold simply by moving lords and heroes around and solving riddles. Worth noting is that some riddles seemed impossible to solve and had me scouring the same piece of the map for turns on end before giving up and deleting the map. There are also pieces of eight for you to find by beating pirate lords in battle. Beating these lords gets you the regiments of renown, which is a really great way to spice it up from the usual lord level grind way to unlock them. One feature they have that I personally don't enjoy is the loyalty mechanic, which means your non-legendary lords can defect if you don't keep them loyal enough. This can be especially hard in the early game when you can't afford to give them full armies and have them in constant battle. And even though it becomes less of an issue later on, I still avoided non-legendary lords where I could. Speaking of lords, you can put them into certain officers once they reach high enough level, and these positions can net them and the faction some serious bonuses, and in my opinion should be a thing for every faction. Finally, the last thing to note is that the climate prefs are borderline cheating, since they can sell nearly anywhere. This opens up the expansion options massively and makes invasions a breeze when travelling to the majority of the map. When playing as the Vampire Coast you have the choice of four legendary lords, each with their own unique faction and each with their own unique playstyles and effects. I'll cover the lords and their effects in their own video and the individual faction effects later on in this one, but for now I'll go over my experience with the Dreadfleet since it was the faction I played for the guide as voted for by the Discord. They start out in the Galleon's Graveyard, which is its own province so they can get a commandment on the go from turn one. They start out at war with the nearby Kaldor, and the majority of my early game was spent harassing them to get as much money as I could. I sacked their settlements a few times and got some nice early levels on Nautilus, so even though I took basically no land, I was stocking up on resources at a decent rate. I also started to take on the Vampire Coast Mutineers to build some rapport with Luther Harkon for a later confederation. Also also, I started searching for treasure using the maps I gathered from my sacking of the High Elves. To start off with I sent Noctilus, but once I'd unlocked a Vampire Fleet Captain, I sent her and she secured me a steady source of income for basically the rest of the game. I then turned my attention to the New World Colonists since they were at war with Silostra, and I of course want to be friends with her for the later confederation. I quickly took them out with my two armies and colonised the remaining regions to speed up the corruption, and to start making myself some more money which I was constantly running out of. After a couple of turns of securing my newly acquired province, I turned my attention to taking out the nearby Lizardmen who had already been weakened by an early Dark Elf war. It did take a little bit longer than I expected, purely because the lizard infantry are more bullet resistant than a ball of rubber, but eventually I managed to take them out and got a third province under my control, which meant I could start spamming the curse of bountiful treasure to get a steady supply of coin coming in. Now it was time for me to give the Hyals my full attention, starting with the western coast of Kaldor. It didn't take long for me to take their capital, and at that point Tyrion started to get nervous and fight back, so I knew I was in for a long fight ahead of me. It was a real cat and mouse and took up the majority of my campaign and it was basically me ravaging his settlements with sacking and raising before he swooped in to resell with his phoenix and chariot spam armies which were insanely hard for me to take out due to me being completely ranged focus. These gates are going to be like the hardest settlements to take from the uh, from the Hiles just because the garrisons are just so damn strong. 
Because, you know, the high elves just need something else to uh, improve them and make them that much... That little bit better. You know, they really need it. One of the weakest factions in the game, honestly. I think they need a buff. During this time, I managed to get all the other Vampire Coast factions confederated, starting with Lufa, who was quickly followed by Silostra, before finally getting Aranesa after a bunch of war declarations. From these confederations, I also had enough resources to start an invasion on two fronts. I had Nautilus in the north taking on Tyrion, and Luther in the south taking on Teclis, and I have to say it went quite well on both fronts. Tyrion put up an irritating fight and kept backdooring me every time I thought I could take a settlement, but eventually I managed to cut him off when I took Lorthen and crippled his economy. After that he was dead in the water, and basically waited for me to take out his last two cities. At some point during all this, I also managed to get my hands on the Sword of Cain, which was actually quite manageable. Since corruption makes public order so robust anyway, and I could focus on improving it with my buildings due to the lack of any need of recruitment buildings, I could let its effects get stronger and stronger without almost any cause for concern. Also worth knowing is that since my infamy was skyrocketing due to the constant battling, one of the legendary pirates started war on me, and for some reason resurrected the blessed dread in the south, which was annoying though easily fixed by ascending in Luther. We took that like one turn ago. Can you? Who is this? Who? Who are you? Literally, who are you? And why do you hate me so much? Is it one of these cocks? It is. It's one of the little cock boys. Mm. Oh, I, I'm I'm a pirate. I'm the pirate king. I'm going to attack you. Twat. At this stage, I realised that I only needed a settlement and a shipbuilding to get the short victory, so I pushed to get this done and finished my campaign in only 120-ish turns. We interrupt our programme to bring you this important message. You there. Are you a part of the 11%? 11% of what? The 11% of people subscribed, of course. You're not. Or what are you waiting for? The button's right there. Subscribing will ensure you never miss a video, and has been proven to increase your epic gamer skill by at least 1%. If you're feeling particularly adventurous, you could also like the video to be in with a chance of winning eternal happiness. So go ahead and subscribe, and join the 11% today. Now return you to your regular scheduled programming. I'll now go over the starting location, expansion options, climate preferences, and unique effects of the factions. The Awakening starts at the Awakening and have the climate preferences of Temperate, Frozen, Ocean, Savanna, Desert, Jungle, and Temperate Island being suitable, Wasteland and Mountain being unpleasant, and Chaotic Wasteland and Magical Forest being uninhabitable. They don't have any unique mechanics, but do get plus 8 leadership versus Lizardmen and minus 60 relations with them. All Vampire Coast factions have great expansion options due to the great climate preferences. But for Luther in particular, it's the nearest option to take over Lustria if you can't be bothered battling half of the legendary lords in the game. I know I've said it before, but why are there so many on this tiny island? Here's a list of who's there aside from Luther: Marcus Wolfhart, Teclas, Loki Felhart, Mazdamundi, Tehenoin, Gorok, Lord Skrolk, and Silostra Diathin. That's nine lords in this tiny corner of the map, not to mention the non-legendary lords. What the fuck's CA? Anyway, they can also cross the sea to the east to take on the Tomb Kings in the desert, go to the northeast to take on the High Elves, Bretonia and the Empire, or straight north to take on Dark Elves. With climate prefs like this, it's really up to you. The Dread Fleet starts at the Galleon's Graveyard and have the same climate preferences as the Awakening. They get access to unique war declaration missions, as well as plus two to crew recruitment capacity and minus one to Necrofex recruit time. Again, they can go in basically any direction for expansion, so it's really down to who you want to fight. West is the mess that is Lustria, north are the High Elves, and east is the desert full of Tomb Kings and Bretonians. The Pirates of Sartosa start at Sartosa and have the same climate prefs as the other two. They get minus 100 relations with Norska, have a plus 25% chance of finding treasure maps, earn plus 50% extra from raiding, and 20% extra from sacking. Since they spawn in a slightly different part of the map than the other guys, they do have different options for expansion, but again, since they can settle nearly anywhere, it's totally up to you. To the north are Dwarves, Empire, Rats, and basically every other Old World faction aside from the Orcs, so while the lands are plentiful, it can be quite tough. To the south are the Deserts with Lizardmen, Bretonia, and the Tomb Kings, and to the west across the ocean are the High Elves, and then eventually Lustria and the Frozen Northwest. Finally, we come to the Drowned, who start in the Monuments of the Moon, and yet again have the same climate prefs as the other guys. They gain plus two loyalty for newly recruited Lords, minus 20% upkeep and recruitment costs for Cyrene and Mongol units, and gets a unique Ethereal Paladin unit. 
Since they spawn in a similar location to the Dreadfleet and the Awakening, they have similar expansion options, but as always, it's very open to whatever you fancy. North and South you have the Frozen Mountains and Lustria respectively, East are the Hives and eventually the Empire and Bretonia, and to the South East are the Deserts with Tomb Kings and even more Bretonians. Now we come to the Commandments, that are the same no matter which sub-faction you're playing. Dredge the Sea grants minus 10% recruitment cost for all zombie units, plus 15 growth, and plus 1 to the local recruitment capacity. Bat Swarms grants minus 20% enemy campaign movement range for armies starting their turn in the province, and plus 2 vampiric corruption. Even More Powder grants plus 1 global recruitment capacity faction wide, plus 3 siege holdout time, and plus 25% ammo for local armies. Finally, Share the Spoils causes loyalty decline to stop for local armies, grant 5 public order at the cost of 10 infamy per turn. And now cover the research tree. It's split into 4 main parts, and while each section contains a variety of projects, they can be mostly summed up like so. Command is generally about infrastructure, Firepower is about upgrading gunpowder units, Salvage is a mix of everything not in the other two, and Legendary Admirals are unique immortal lords that are only accessible through research. Each section contains a variety of projects that grant things like combat improvements, economy improvements, and cost reductions for a number of things. Basically, it's pretty standard. Now I'll go over the unique effects of the Vampire Coast, and explain how each system works as best I can. Since they're an undead faction, they get access to the same raised dead mechanic that the Vampire Counts do. When you have an army selected, you can click the raised dead icon to see what units are available. By default, it's normally just basic low level units, but when you're nearby to a great battle site, you can get access to some high level units and in much higher quantities. This can allow you to recover from big fights in a flash by instantly filling your armies with a whole new horde of units and is super powerful during sustained invasions. You also share the vampiric corruption mechanic with the vampire counts, meaning they need their regions to be covered in the stuff for them to be able to effectively settle there. A lack of corruption will cause severe public order penalties, and a high level of it will provide you with a bonus, which makes the faction into one of the simultaneously hardest and easiest factions to expand as. A high concentration of corruption also causes non-vampire armies to suffer attrition when moving in your borders, so it's always worth corrupting as fast as possible. Funnily enough, the Vampire Coast armies didn't seem to take any attrition when moving in untainted lands, and I don't know if that's the way it's meant to be or not, but it's how it was for me, and it made it crazy easy to invade people. Something unique for this faction are the treasure maps. They are found after battles, or by digging up other treasures, and give you vague directions as to where treasure can be found. To acquire this treasure, you must move a lord or hero into the area where it's hidden, and use a unique dig movement stance to see if you have the right spot. The maps don't give you the exact location, they will instead give you the area, and provide a riddle for you to solve to find the booty. These riddles can vary from stupid easy to near unsolvable, but keep digging around, and you're sure to get your hands on all sorts of goodies. Pirate Coves are another thing unique to these guys, and they're kinda like the predecessors to Skaven Undercities. They can be made by using a vampire fleet captain on a coastal settlement, and allow you to construct one of four buildings. They each offer their own unique effects, but honestly, I just stuck to using the 50% of the settlement's wealth building, and spam them on money makers to keep the cash rolling in. Each time you settle one, it increases the cost of settling another by 200% for 15 turns, but honestly, once you get under Lawthorn or Marienburg, it's like printing money, and it's super easy to get the funds for more. You do have to speculate to accumulate, however, as these buildings are not cheap, and can easily see you sinking 10 grand before you start to see anything back. Once you do see it coming back, it comes in an ocean of coin. The Vampire Coast also have a unique method of acquiring regiments of renown. Rather than the usual faction leader levelling, you instead have to beat a number of roaming pirate factions to collect some piece of eight that lock the units for you. This does mean you'll have to wait till later in the game to get them, but once you do, you can basically get them all in one go via a lengthy ocean world tour. Yet another thing they have is the shipbuilding mechanic. This is basically like horde buildings from the Beastmen and Chaos Warriors, with one major difference. You can also take settlements, so getting the coin to upgrade your hordes is a piece of cake. Like a horde, you can build a wide range of buildings that allow you to recruit every unit in the faction, as well as providing bonuses to move range, replenishment, and so on. I personally went for the strat of only recruiting from ships and using settlements for money making and nothing else, and even though it was a slow and rocky start, by the end it was a cakewalk with me gaining one ship growth per turn and being able to build anything I wanted thanks to my Scrooge McDuck pile of gold. But wait, there are even more things these guys have that's unique. The infamy system is kinda like the chivalry system, but you get rewards for doing the opposite things. Sacking, raising, and basically doing anything else a pirate would will net you boatloads of infamy, and while it can't be spent on much other than some research and the occasional commandment, it's still fun to collect as much as you can. Once you get to high enough infamy, you move up the list of infamous pirates, and overtaking these green ones will cause them to go to war with you. 
beating these guys rewards you with one of the three verses of the pirate shanty, each one being more powerful than the last. The verses can be used in battle, and the buffs affect your entire army, and even come with some loose singing sound effects, which is pretty neat too. Finally, we come to the officers, which is basically like the old elect count system from the Empire. It's basically a selection of positions that your lords can be placed in that will provide different buffs for them, their armies, and the faction as a whole. They have to be high enough level, but once they pass level 8, they can go into any of the slots you want, so it doesn't exactly take long to fill them all up. The effects cover a wide range of stuff, but my two personal favourites to get first are the upkeep reduction and the crew growth options, since they both make your early game that much easier. Finally, we come to the rights. Cursed of Bountiful Treasure costs nothing, has a 1 turn duration and a 15 turn cooldown. You get 500 gold for every buried treasure building and this should be spammed on cooldown as much as you can since it's literally free money. The Curse of the Sea Mist costs 3500 gold, lasts 5 turns and has a 30 turn cooldown. It causes all owned regions to be covered in mist which causes attrition which you're of course immune to, as well as vanguard deployment for a whole bunch of units. The Curse of Eternal Service costs 2000 gold, has a 5 turn duration and a 20 turn cooldown. It grants a 50% chance of lords gaining loyalty every turn, makes it impossible for loyalty to decline, and grants plus 5 public order faction wide. Finally, we have the Curse of Queen's Cannon, which costs 1000 gold, has a 10 turn duration, and a 25 turn cooldown. It grants a Queen Best to the recruitment pool, as well as plus 15% casualty replenishment rate faction wide. Worth noting is you can only have one of these beauties in your faction at once, so use her wisely. That concludes this section of the guide on campaign strategy. The next section will cover the unit roster and how I believe each unit is best used, so stay tuned for that. Don't forget to vote in the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description and the comments. If you want to check out the other parts of this or any other guide, there's a link in the card and in the description for a playlist of the series. If you enjoyed this video at any point, please do consider leaving it a like as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, maybe click that subscribe button so you stay up to date. After all, it is free. For now though, I was Gunnel Dampness, and I'll see you next turn.